image or snapshot or fingerprint, whatever you'd like to call it, of that problem. You can clearly see in your temperature trajectories, for example, maybe it's a very steep ramp in the temperature that was the cause of the problem. You can then look out for that. If you're sampling data at once every eight hours, once per day, down here in the lab, you don't have that resolution. You don't have that fingerprinting ability to accurately diagnose. Okay, so, so this is uh, this is important to understand. It's incredibly insightful why we should be monitoring our real-time systems. This is not something that appears in textbooks. For some reason, the standard um, Six Sigma textbooks, Six Sigma courses, they don't emphasize this point. They talk about doing monitoring, but they don't understand the reason why it's so critical to do it up there. And these are the many reasons. Because we get far more precise data, we get them extremely frequently, those data are multiple, and they get a very accurate fingerprint. Usually, we can tell cause and effect very clearly from this real-time data because each problem has a unique signature or fingerprint in the way it shows up. Lab data, there could be an infinite number of reasons why your viscosity is high or your melt index isn't why it needs to be. But here, there's pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship with the fingerprint in, its, in the data that you see. So for example, the steep slope in the temperature trajectory at a certain rate, that is almost always a one-to-one -one relationship to the actual problem that you'll see downstream. So monitor here and not over here for those many good reasons. The other point I want to emphasize, uh, this one is further on in the notes, and uh, we went through a few of these industrial case studies last time, but I wanted to talk a bit more about industrial monitoring. Here in the notes are some guidance based on experience I've uh, had with other companies implementing these monitoring systems, uh, talking to companies like Stelco and uh, not Stelco, but Tupasco, Artful Retail, about how they've gone about their monitoring systems. They have annual meetings where they exchange ideas with their engineers. So this is some guidance that, that's come out of those discussions with them and uh, will be, should be helpful for you. The first thing to remember one of the things that you will face, so Marshall Retail talks about this a lot uh, when I work with, uh, with uh, Alcoa, this was a big, big issue was to get the data out the system. We've got these marvelous databases that archive the data for us, but the engineers have very little way of actually getting the data out subsequently. And certainly not, it's not easy, it's not just a website that you go to and say, give me the values from beginning to end at a certain sampling frequency. Some companies have that set up, but most companies need to go find the guy in IT, and he's not available, and he's on conference, or he's not here, um, and he's upset that you want six gigabytes of data. So it's a real challenge to get those, those data out. Then, even if you've got the data out, now you want to implement this monitoring system, and you want it to be in real time. Most companies have never set up real time systems in their sites internally. They've done it outside with outside companies selling them expensive software to do it. So sometimes getting those real-time monitoring charts implemented themselves is a challenge or they or they just go to an outside company and have them do it for them. So that's that's often a satisfactory uh, way of doing it. Let's talk about the procedure one should follow to do this. Again, this is not this is not given uh, in any textbooks that I know of. This is based on experience, and I just want to show you visually what this would look like. So I'll, I'll draw up a fictitious example, and we'll we'll work through this procedure. The first step is clearly to identify which variable you want to monitor, and from this discussion here, it should be apparent that it's not lab values. We should be going to your real-time data that's coming off your process. So you retrieve a certain amount of that historical data. And it might look like this, for example. Here's your process over a long period of time to go and collect data. And it may be that here's regular process operation and then some, some fault occurred and it took a while for your process to recover. And again, more regular operation, then a plant shut down for a number of days. Regular production. So that would be an example of typical data. And there will probably be a whole bunch of uh, missing values as well. So I won't show missing values, but 
there would certainly be gaps in that when maybe the sensor was taken offline for calibration or so forth. So what I mean here is let's import the data and just plot it. Let's take a look at what we see. Are there outliers, spikes, missing data gaps? And our aim here in step four is to locate regions of common cause operation. Remove outliers and spikes. Clean up your data set. In the assignment, I will have an actual data set for you to work on the next assignment. And you'll have to go pre-clean your data set. Now, a small data set, you can easily do that in Excel. We can quickly go here and we can identify this period of time as being from non-common cause operation. So step four is we want to find common cause operation. Clearly, that's not common cause. Plant shutdown not common cores. Missing values are not common cores. You, you omit those from your data set. Here's a, here's a good guidance to use for, for deciding what common cause is. If during this time that you were producing product and you sold that product to your customer and they were happy with it, you can safely consider that to be common cause operation. Okay, so if there's general, if you're looking for some guidance, that could be a, a crude rule of thumb. So let's imagine we've gone and screened out these data, and this will take you a phenomenal time, a phenomenal amount of time, especially if this is a large data set. But if we've done that, we can now go and redraw that data set and take it, and we would get the following. We would take these regions like that, and we simply just bump these portions of data together. So that region comes from over there, and I take these points and I we take now this reduced data set. So this is a reduced data set. And what set five is telling me is to take this now and consider this as my phase one data. These are the data that I'm going to build my, my monitoring chart from. So what I do is, I'll take this data set, however long it is, and I'll typically, this is my rule of thumb, is to split it 60-40. So split it so that's 60% and that's 40%. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that 60% chunk to determine the upper and lower control limits. So I go and calculate X bars, I go and calculate X bars, I go do all the procedure that we've, we've done by hand a few times. And in the assignment, you're going to write a script to automate this for yourself. And you're going to calculate the upper and lower control limits from this region. So I can make a note up here so you can see it at the back of the class. This is 60% upper control limits and lower control limits. Then you go take this other 40%. Now this other 40% is still considered good data. This is still considered common cause data. What you go do is you go run this other 40% through your monitoring charts as if it were new data. So pretend this was data from your process right now and treat it as a simulation. What would my control chart have done if it had seen this good data? And we expect, because this is phase one, uh, because this is common cause data, we expect to see no alarms from this 40% chunk. But if that really was from common cause operation, none of that data should show any alarms on your monitoring chart. So this is excellent data to judge what the type one error is. If I see alarms here, I can quickly get an estimate of what my type 1 error is going to be based on that. Also important to go do is to go take this data that you consider to be abnormal and run it through the same monitoring chart. Those data are going to be excellent ways to judge your type 2 error. Okay, so this strategy here that I'm outlining is giving you a, me a method to find <coughs> control limits from the 60% chunk, then you go use your 40% chunk to go estimate your type 1 error. You go use the unusual data that you threw out to go measure your type 2 error. And if those type 1, type 2 errors are okay for you, you stop. 
But if they're unacceptable, you need to go adjust your limits so that you get the type 1 error, the type 2 error that you're looking for. So we had a bit of a discussion in the previous class of what type 1 and type 2 is and, and the fact that it's asymmetrical, those errors. So very, very iterative and sometimes tedious. Like you can argue that this can be pretty tedious to, to estimate those limits. Now here's the crucial step. Many people go ahead and they put that control chart online in the operator's room and they tell the operators monitor this chart and, and it will make your life easy. No, it won't. What you must do is you must use the chart yourself for a couple of days. Go run that chart with the upper lower control limits on your process, on real-time data right now for a couple of days. Some companies do this even for weeks before they unleash it on the operators. Because you must see as an engineer, you've got far more insight into what this monitoring chart is doing and what its intention is, to make sure that it actually does work as you're going to promise. Your operators will lose all their confidence in you right away if you're giving them something that's wasting their time. Okay? And they're going to be very suspicious of any, doing any future work for you if you've proven yourself once in the past to not have useful tools. So you must, in order to maintain your credibility, run it on your computer desktop for a couple of days and make sure that those limits work as needed. Troubleshoot it yourself. If you're at your desk and it goes outside the limit, you go to the plant floor and see how you can troubleshoot it. Can you successfully do it yourself? If you can do it, then your operators probably can. But if you can't succeed, your operators are definitely not going to do it. Okay, so many, many times people fail at this at control charting because they don't do a full assessment of its capability. And then other points to remember is that it's not going to solve the world for you. It's not going to tell you what is wrong. You still have to use your head and troubleshoot this process. So monetary charts do not say that they're going to figure out what the problem is. You have to go look at the patterns in the chart. Is there an oscillation maybe that you noticed? A sharp spike? Some trend that's correlated to an unusual event in the process and use your knowledge. Um, so we, we looked at this a bit in 4N um, as well as using those troubleshooting skills from patterns in the chart. Finally, then you go to your boss and ask for money to implement this online. Because now you've got evidence that this works. You can go show your boss, look, this chart, when I was running it in demo mode on my desktop, I picked up unusual operation, and just that single instance or two or three instances that I was able to figure out what was going wrong translates into this many dollars and you can get the approval for it. So you must translate the effectiveness of the monitoring chart over to dollar figures. Okay, so this is just some general guidance. Make no mistake that this process that I've outlined here takes in the order of weeks to implement. It's not, not fast, but if you do it for one variable, the process to do it for, for other variables becomes much, much faster. The first time you have to get one of the computer systems implemented, the real-time data systems, the plotting systems implemented, it takes a bit of work Okay, any, any questions on that topic before we move on? It's a lot of fun when it does work. It really works phenomenally well, as you've seen here in some of these case studies that I've shown. So what I'd like to talk about next is this topic of Six Sigma that you often see and hear. And just put it in, into context, right? So we hear Six Sigma, we hear this terminology, companies hype it as a fairly big thing. Um, but let's take a look at, at, at the Six Sigma topic itself. I will stress the following. Six Sigma, when you hear it used in industry, this course could be considered a Six Sigma course. We cover process monitoring, we cover least squared, we cover design experiments, we cover hypothesis or confidence tests. All of those are part of a broader Six Sigma training program in any company. They look at it very, from a very different perspective, um, slightly simplified in order to, to be taught at the industrial level. This aspect we're going to look at today is one subset of Six Sigma, but it's where the name comes from, and it's important to understand. So as was in the weekly test, you had this question where you calculate the process capability ratio for a process, which is operating between a certain upper spec limit and a lower spec limit. 
And most of you got this question right, pretty easy. Substitute your upper spec, lower spec limit into that equation, divide by six sigma, and you get your capability ratio. But what does that number mean? And what are the assumptions that go into it? So to understand what that is all about, let's just back up a bit and visualize this quickly. So most companies on their critical variables will have an upper and lower specification limits. These are not the same as the control limits we've just been looking at. For sure our charts. So here's my, here's my process, here's my target. And let's take just common cause operations shown here. My process will be moving around in that manner. My upper spec, uh, my, my upper control limit would be somewhere over here. So this is my upper control limit, and I'll also have a lower control limit. So we're comfortable with those. These are from Shuart. Now, we also have the upper and lower specification limits. These will, for a good process, be outside your control limits. So here you'll have your upper specification limit and you'll have your lower specification limit. Okay. These are from specs for your process, which is where their name comes from. So you guarantee to your customer that you will receive a product which has this quality variable within these upper and lower specification limits. Internally, your control limits are tighter than the specification limits. You will create an alarm and investigate it in your process when you go outside your control limits. You guarantee to your customer that they will never receive a product outside the specification. So these spec limits are guarantees to your customer. Which is why I said they, will, they should be, for a good production facility, outside your control limits. If they're within your control limits, you've got problems. You're selling crap to your customers. So you'll see these spec limits either match or exceed the, their respective <coughs> control limits. So a packaging line that needs to guarantee, say, a thousand grams of product in their packages, the lowest specification limits is thousand, a thousand grams. And in those production lines, your lower control limit will be pretty close to your lowest spec limit. But in many cases, there's a fair amount of gap here. Now, what Six Sigma refers to, refers to this span here. Okay. That range or span is equal to Six Sigma. Is what or, or could be considered six minutes gives you your process control ratio. So that let's but this is, don't write this down as all the time. This is for a very specific case. This is for a case where we're assuming our process is centered. So my target here is midway between the upper and lower specification limits. What I do then is I find the sigma of my process multiply it by 6, divide through that, and it gets me a metric called process capability ratio. Just tell me how capable my process is. I take the standard deviation from my process, divide through by 6 sigma, and I get my process capability ratio. Now, a process with a very high capability ratio is desirable. Processes with low PCRs are undesirable. I'll, we'll take a look at a few examples. And this interpretation that PCR should be seen as your process is width. What is the bandwidth or the width of your process? Let's take a look at this case. Here's a process where my aim is to be producing product at 80. My target is 80 units. My lowest specification limit is 65. My upper specification limit is 95. There's a range of 30 units between upper and lower specification limits. If my process is producing product that's at the target, so I am telling my customers, you're going to receive a product that's at 80, nominally, you'll be receiving product that's at 80, but it could be between 65 and 95. If internally in my process I'm producing product 
where I'm at 80, but I've got a standard deviation day to day to day of 10 units. So 80 is here, a, pro a standard deviation of 10 units. This process, if I plug into that PCR formula, is a, a PCR or process capability of only 0.5. Very, very low. Let's take a look at a higher process capability ratio and what that means. A higher capability ratio process, same mean, same lower spec, same upper spec, but now I'm producing product with a quarter of the standard deviation that I initially had. So only a quarter of the standard deviation of two and a half units. Plug that into PCR formula, I get a PCR of two units this time. So higher process capability. Notice then that almost none of my production for a standard deviation of 2.5 units, none of my production exceeds the lower and upper specification units. Whereas for a process where I had a PCR of only a a substantial amount of my production actually falls outside those limits. 13.5% of the product that I make on my process lies outside those limits. I'm either going to have to scrap it or sell it at reduced cost or suffer some form of loss for that. So very, very poor capability here. Capability ratio of 0.5, I'm throwing away a lot of the product that I produce. A high capability ratio, two units, is producing essentially, if I follow the same formula to calculate the amount of product outside those tails, it is essentially zero. This process with a PCR of two units, process capability of two units, we say has a process width of 12 sigma. There are 12 standard deviations from the lower specification limit all the way to the upper specification limit. I can put 12 sigmas into that space. Whereas with this process earlier, with a larger standard deviation of 10 units, I can fit only three sigma into those into that gap. From lower spec to upper spec, so it's 30 units, my standard deviation is 10, so I've got three, three, pros, three standard deviations of width there. Processes with a high capability ratio have a higher width. Why is this important? As a customer, I want to know my supplier's process capability ratio, and companies often request that number. So companies will go in and do an audit of their supplier and ask to see what their process capability ratio is. Guaranteed, I will choose the supplier that can give me a higher capability ratio for the following reason. No process ever remains at target. Guaranteed, your supplier's process will drift from time to time. So the moment that this histogram starts to drift, these tails start to move outside the, the specification limits. A company that's got a very small standard deviation, or in other words, a high capability, they can tolerate a fair amount of drift before they start to reach that lower or upper specification limit. So as a customer, I want my supplier to have a high capability. It means that I will still be receiving good product from them despite any drift or movement in their process, which is inevitable. So we can never accept or we can never expect to be on target all the time. We must have some room to move. The process capability ratios tell me how much room do I have to move before I start to exceed those limits. Okay, so that's, that's the interpretation you should have from the process capability. Now, when you go do an audit or you, on, a, on a supplier, or when you request this number, there's two other additional assumptions you must make. The first one is obviously that the process is centered. So between the upper and lower specification limits, you're operating normally at target, halfway between. That's the first assumption. But two other important assumptions are that that attribute that you're measuring there is normally distributed. It's easy to check if you've got the raw data with the QT plot. But very critically, that you calculate that metric based on data when the process is stable. How can you tell that? How can you tell that the process is stable when you calculate the PCR? So I need to go get raw data, 
I use those raw data to calculate sigma. Sigma is the only, only piece of information I, I need. My upper spec and lower spec limits, those are given. Right? I know where I should be. I, that's in, in the specification for my process. <coughs> sigma is the only piece of data I need. I go to my database, collect a whole bunch of data, verify that it's normally distributed, verify that I'm sensitive, but how can I be sure that I'm stable? check for stability of the process. One way we can check stability is with a, a monitoring chart. So a Shula chart is a monitoring chart to check that you're on target and that you're stable. So I can consider my process to be stable if the data fall within the upper and lower controller. So that requires you to it pre-requires you to have a monitoring chart for this variable that you measure. Which is why these topics are so tied up. When you take a Six Sigma course or you learn about the process monitoring, we have to understand monitoring because we need to have a stable process, a stable a process which is only under common cause operation. That's a prerequisite then to go calculate the, the capability ratio. So this is pretty hard to do, right? It means that you first have to verify stability and then go calculate the capability. But there's many there's many instances where your target isn't symmetrically between upper and lower specification limits. So for example, if I'm packaging a product, my you can be sure I don't want to I want to be close to giving my customer just the bare minimum to qualify as a as a complete package. So my target then will be as close to that spec limit as possible. And you don't really care about overfilling. That's your loss. But you're going to try and operate as close to that constraint. So most targets are actually asymmetrical. That's the next topic we're going to look at. So what we've considered so far is the very specific case, an unusual case, when you, when you are symmetric. OK, so stability, but stability is one prerequisite. That you're centered is the second one, and that you've got a normal distribution of data. Let's go take a look now at, at this example of asymmetric processes, so or uncentered processes. So this is far more common. And what we do is we simply we work with the bound that we happen to be closest to. So if we come, come back to this example here, my closest capability ratio then is, we call this PCR subscript K. Another term you'll see for this, if, far more commonly actually is CPK. So you'll hear companies talk about CPK, CPK, CPK all the time in their Six Sigma courses. This is exactly what it means. Pick which node you're closest to. So if I'm closest to my upper specification limit, I'm going to use this term. If I'm closest to my lower specification limit, I'm going to use that term. Basically this formula is saying, pick the limit that's going to make this number look the worst. Okay. You're not going to pick the limit that's going to make this number look better and inflate your your value and light. You're going to find the limit that you're closest to. So my process is here with the target, and then I've got my my lower control limit, closest, I uh, sorry, lower specification limit. My upper specification limit is here. I'm really only considering the standard deviations around this zone. I'm, the fact that I'm far away from that one is of no importance to me. So I'm going to pick x double bar for my target minus the lower specification limit divided by three sigma this time. Okay, so x double bar is your target. It's so the x double bar that you've got from the Shua chart. And here's some numbers. Here's some numbers to get you a feel for what are good and bad CDKs. These numbers also can are interpreted in exactly the same way for, for a centered process. Okay, so uh, for either centered or uncentered, you can take this as general guidance. Most companies want to see a CPK of 1.3 minutes or higher. Safety critical processes, CPK of 1.7. And a process that's considered to be a six sigma process has a CPK of two units. Okay, so it can move six sigma units to the left, all six sigma units to the right. So there's a total available width of 12 sigma for it. 
but it can go six sigma one way and hit the limit, or six sigma the other way before it hits the limit. Nuclear reactors and control systems for those sorts of systems, they can often take higher CPKs than even two. Pharmaceutical area, uh, we sometimes look for CPKs of four units, which is just phenomenal. Like you, your limits are so, so broad, you'll never ever hit them. How can, you, how can you improve your CPK? How can I make my CPK a higher value? specification limits. Those are fixed. By definition, they're specified. Right? So people often think that, oh, of course, if I change my specification, I can make myself look better. Yes, you can. But no, you shouldn't. What are the other things you can go do to improve CPK? If you're producing a CPK, say, of one unit, and you really want to sell to a customer, but that customer is not going to accept your product until you bump up your CPK to 1.5, what are the things you can go do? Change your target. You change your target or you work on your on your signal, so you your standard deviation. Okay, so if I'm if I'm currently at this number of standard deviations away from my specification, limit, I can back my target off, move my target away from the specification limit. So this number in the numerator will get larger. So move away from your specification limit is what that's saying. <coughs> or reduce your standard deviation. You can do one or you can do both. Right? You don't have to do um, one or the other. You can do both, certainly. Which one is easier to implement? Moving your target, for sure. It's really just a, set, a simple change to your set point and your control loops. But that's probably going to cost you a fair bit of money. Right? So economically, there's going to be a penalty to moving away from your, from your target. There certainly is no free solution there, right? Either way, it's going to cost you some money. Moving your target is going to cost you some money. Reducing sigma can often cost you a lot of money and may, in some instances, even be impossible to implement. So then your only recourse is to change your target. So what I'd like to do then is just, uh, let's go through an example that, that quantifies that for you. So here's a question. The most recent estimate of the process capability ratio was 1.3. So work on this with your partner next to you. We've got a CPK of 1.3. An average quality is 64 units. You're given upper and lower specifications. Show what you can adjust and by how much you can adjust them. To get an improved CPK of 1.67. So CPK current is 1.3 units. The target is 64 units. We've got a lower spec of 56. Your upper spec is 93. So you're very, very close, or you're close certainly to your lower specification and pretty far from your upper specification limit. So we're, we're dealing with CPK and not CP. First question, what can you adjust? We've just covered that. But secondly, by how much? close to this nice limit of 1.67 that companies often look for. So you want to bump up your CPK by 0.3 units. It seems like a small amount, that 0.3 unit change. But CPK of 1.67, 1.7, that's a number that most companies look for.
Okay, so the first step is to recognize we're closer to the lowest specification limit. So if we go back to that formula to use the, the one is this one over here, x double bar minus the lowest spec limit divided by 3. So we're always going to choose the worst of the two, and the worst of the two is always going to be the one that's closer to the limit. So we can, we can see that quite quickly. Our target is 64 units and closer to the 56 spec than I am to 93 spec. <coughs> so we're told that that value is, is 1.3, so we know that's 1.3. My target x double bar then is 56, sorry, it's uh, 64. My lowest specification limit is 56. Divided by 3 sigma, I can then solve the sigma on my process is currently uh, 2.05 units. So this is just, I'm just finding my base case here. What can we change? And by how much to achieve this 1.67? Well, we, as we just discussed, we can go change x double bar, or we can go change sigma itself. Let's take a look at the first case of changing my target, my mean. So I'd like then a CPK of 1.67. That's equal to x double bar minus the lowest spec limit, which stays fixed at 56 units, divided by the 3 times sigma, 2.05 units, solve for x double bar of 66.3. So it gives us exactly what we expect. We have to move from a current target of 64 units up to a slightly higher value of 66. So if I wanted to visualize it, here's my target. Here's my lowest spec limit at 56. <coughs> so it's saying to move that target up to, so this is my new target, 66 units, 66 points. So back off from your specification limit. So that's easy to do in, in most companies. You just change your, up, your set operating procedure to be at that new, new level. But there is an alternative. We can also go change sigma. So I can leave my target where it is and go change sigma instead. So let's try, try doing that. Let's adjust sigma. <laughs> CPK new is 1.67, but I want to maintain my current target of 64 units, minus 56 for the lowest spec limit divided by 3 sigma, so that new variance, or sorry, new standard deviation is 1.6 units. So, again as expected, I've gone and changed my standard deviation from 2 units initially, down to 1.6 units. So can we make some improvements in our process to get a lower standard deviation? That, how, how can one get a lower standard deviation on the process? You just want to keep your target the same, remain operating at a 64 target, but pull in my standard deviation from 2 units down to 1.6 units. What are some of the things you could consider to do that? You can use a more pure starting material. Use pure starting material that would, if that would reduce the variance, yes. Anything else? Yeah. What leads to what leads to high variability in a process? What what increases variance with standard deviation? Absolutely. 
Train, train your operators so there's less variance between your operators and their implementation of how they, uh, or their, their process of how they monitor and change the process. All of those, all of those are valid ways of reducing sigma. Sigma is a, is a hard one to, to adjust. It's often far more costly to adjust the sigma than it is to adjust the part of it. Um, so it, to, to reduce sigma often requires capital expenditure. Whereas to adjust your target X double bar is, is usually costing nothing, but there's going to be some penalty for it over the long term. Because there's usually a reason why you're operating at a lower or a higher value. So here, for example, I'm operating at a low target. Maybe that target represents temperature, or it's related to energy input into the process. Having to move to a higher target now may require me to spend more money to maintain that operation at the higher target. Okay, so Changing the target easily implemented that will cost you money over the long term. Changing sigma usually going to cost you a whole front of upfront uh, cash to in terms of new equipment or upgrades or training on your operators, but then it should pay back for itself over time. So though, that gets you the two perspectives on on the issue there. Now there are some other questions here in the in the back of the slides that are related to CPK. You can go through um, some of these. They're, they're very straightforward, they're all from previous tests and exams. What I do, do want to come up with is uh, just point you to, right here at the beginning of the slide, we had uh, this, this particular one, where we looked at some definitions. Make sure that you can interpret all those concepts you've covered in the past few classes, understand what these topics mean, and uh, that will give you a good, a good base to, to say that I know this material. In the class tomorrow, we will start B squared. So Wednesday and Friday, we'll be able to get a very quick recap of B squared because it's something that you've seen before. And after this, we'll make the